So uh, welcome to the term four Moodle workshop. Uh, the goal of this workshop is not for us to get way down into the weeds and to try to dig into everything that Moodle can do. Uh, it's a very impressive learning management system. It's an open source piece of software, which means that there are innumerable plugins that are developed by uh, different types of software engineers. Um, there are hundreds, if not thousands of different options that you can add to your Moodle site. Um, there are also many, many stock options that are built into the Moodle site that we have. Um, typically, the, the features that you'll be using are, will not be too advanced. Um, I, what we've been doing over the last few years, I think, has really only scratched the surface of Moodle's capability. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is, uh, well, what we're going to do today is to give you an overview uh, first of our basic structure of the pedagogy here at Future Generations and uh, then I'm going to talk about the Moodle overall. I'm going to give you a tour of the site. I'm going to show you the course templates that have been set up for your courses. I'm going to show you some existing courses that you'll have access to, which you know may be uh, as useful to you uh, or more useful than, than anything else, seeing what others at Future Generations have done. I'll then, sh I'll then show you some training courses that we have uploaded to the Moodle site um, that are uh, in the style of Moodle courses, but are actually designed to help you learn Moodle. Uh, I've actually found this quite useful. Then I'll, we'll, we'll take a tour outside of Moodle um, and look at some tools that are available to you on the internet for learning, um, learning the ropes of this LMS, uh, specifically uh, Moodle Docs, which is a very extensive uh, wiki that has all sorts of, of written instructions for how to do pretty much anything you can dream of on Moodle. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll show you um, some YouTube resources. Uh, you know, personally, uh, I love watching videos, especially first, when I'm trying to really orient myself to how to use a new technology um, or get grips with, with some, something new. Uh, I, I'll go to YouTube and, and see what videos are available um, because watching an hour on how to do something, um, for me, sometimes can teach me three or four times as much as reading for an hour. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, Paula will uh, get down about as far into the weeds as we will today, and she will show you um, uh, some of the activities and resources that are available to you on our Moodle site that will help you build your course. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Christy here in a second, um, but you know, I just first, you know, I want to uh, reiterate, um, and and I think hopefully you all know this, you know, because you're here attending the session uh, for years. We uh, at Future Generations sort of had a, you know, br bring, bring or use whatever technology you like policy. Um, and that was difficult for students because uh, some faculty would use one technology, other faculty would use another. And since we've uh, made it, uh, the, the curriculum a lot more uniform by using Moodle across the board, our students have really, I think, been able to grip the technology much more firmly and have been able to dig in much deeper. And, and I think it's really improved uh, the, the learning here at Future Generation. So um, thank you for taking it seriously. And uh, you know, learning, learning about Moodle is really something that is uh, as much of an independent uh, enterprise as, as anything. I, I will show you some resources today. And then at the end, I will offer you uh, a private session a little bit down the road when you're building your course. If you'd like to meet with me and, and or Paula for an hour or so and have us actually help you uh, figure out which widgets go where and to you know get into the weeds and design different pieces of your course, we're very happy to do that. Uh, of course, at, for in this workshop, we won't really have time to do too much of that specific work. Uh, but what we will have time to do is, is give you an overview of what re learning resources are available to you and to get you oriented to our Moodle site um, overall. So uh, first, uh, let me turn it over to Christy, and she's going to go over some big picture stuff with you, uh, and then she'll hand it back to me, and we'll start digging into Moodle. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. First of all, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to our class. This is the class that you'll be working with is a class of 2017, which is the eighth cohort of our program. I know Henry has worked with most of our classes. Uh, Sonia, you have worked with one of our classes. Andrea, you are, you are new. And we have made some changes with this class. So the model is slightly different even 
from uh, what what you're used to, Henry, and and Sonny, from what you experienced with the I think class 2015 that you worked with in Rwanda. With with each, and please feel free to ask questions as you go along, either of me or or Jesse or Paula. And so the the first thing that that's important to to know is that we each course has three components. We have the online component, which is Moodle, and that's that's the main reason why you're here today because it's quite an important component. And those that aren't here, uh, we will be working with individually, and hopefully they'll be able to listen to this recording also. And and also Zoom. Zoom is a feature that you'll be able. What we're on right now is a feature that you'll be able to use with the students also, which is an important way to, to still have that kind of face-to-face -face contact even without being together. And so we have found Zoom to be quite effective, a little, a little hard across time zones, as you know, but still it's an effective way to get people together. The second component uh, is the, the residential. And the term for residential, as I think most of you know, is usually supposed to be in the United States. Because of the visa situation though, and because most of our students are from Ethiopia, we have realized that it, it just is probably um, really unrealistic to think that most of our student body would get into the US. And so this week, we have made a change to the Philippines because we have partners in the Philippines. And so I will talk with you, each of you individually about how that affects your participation in the course. And so we won't go into that right now, but um, the, the Philippines ended up seeming the, the most logical because Ethiopians do not need visas to get there and, uh, and it just is, is, is much easier than the US. So that, we'll put that aside, we'll talk, I'll talk individually with you about that. And then the third component that's new is a lab component. What, the students are involved in their community in the practicum project, but we felt that that the courses themselves didn't have enough of that community application opportunity. And so that's what, why we have a lab component in each of the courses. And you'll see this much more clearly as Jesse presents the courses. The point breakdown is such that, uh, that students uh, attempt a total of 100 points and that's divided among the three components, the, the online, the residential, and the lab. A, a traditional way that this is broken down is students attempt 40 points in the online section. They get 20 participation points in the residential. So when you teach your courses, you actually will not re be responsible for that 20 participation points. That's, that's allotted by the, by the people overseeing the, the, la the, the residential. Again, we can get more specifically into that with each of you. And then the lab are normally projects where students are, um, are apply their learning in their community. And, and normally that might look like uh, a 20 opportunities to do 20 point projects. And so it's something larger that they can, where, uh, that they can work out in their community. The difference in term four now is that normally the residential is in the middle. Now, because of the timing and students graduating at the end, the residential will be at the end. It's in October of the term. The, the term extends from July to the 1st of November. So you will have the, the online section and then lab assignments and the residential comes at the end. With the online, what we have tried to do with courses is to stagger them to help students with time management so they're not responsible for four courses, four or five all at once. And so, so we will divide up the courses and you can let me know if you have a preference where you will be on in your online section either during the month of July or the month of August. So that's the intensive time of your online time. Then the month of September will be devo devoted to the lab assignments and then October is of course the residential. That's what the organization of the, of the course will look like. Another change that we have made this term is 
is kind of a distinction between activities and artifacts. We notice that sometimes the whole focus is on the artifacts, so on perfecting an essay or perfecting a paper. But in a, an applied program like ours, we want more focus to be on the activities where students are actually doing things in their communities. And then, and then the, the artifact of documenting that activity. And so the, the, you'll see when you, if you've looked at the sample syllabi that we, that we show one column for activity and one for the artifact. The artifact is, is that documentation. So you have to see that, but that we try to give options to students. They could give us, they could give a paper, they could present a, do a PowerPoint, they could give a podcast of video. So different types of, of ways to, to document their, their activities in their community. Um, as you know, our students are, are global. They're from, for most of them, English is a, is a second or a third or fourth language. And so, so usually uh, just by doing an essay or a paper, they, they might not shine as much as doing some kind of other artifact. And so that's why we like to give choices in that. And that leads me to my, my final point about giving choices. What we've tried to do with this class is, is give different options as far as what students do. For example, in the lab, you might have three options for a, a project, 20 points each, and they choose two of those. Or the online section, you might have uh, you know, several modules and they choose, choose uh, four out of six or something like that, just to give students uh, the opportunity to do what's most relevant to them and to make that choice. We try to, we're, we're trying to move as much as possible in the direction of, of students taking responsibility for their learning and, and student-directed learning. And by offering some choices, then that, that just gets yeah. us a little bit further in that direction of, of student-directed learning. Uh, I think that is about, uh, do you have anything to add to that, Jesse, or if there are any questions um, uh, um, about the program in general? If not, then we'll move more into Moodle. Uh, I don't have a lot to add at this point. I think that was a great overview. Thanks, Christy. Uh, mm -hmm. I would you know, direct uh, you all to the faculty manual. There uh, is quite a bit of additional information about the um, elements of the curriculum and the courses that Chrissy just described there. There's also some examples of, act of learning activities and learning artifacts. Uh, there's also a three-part course template. It's very simple, but it gives you a basic overview of uh, what would be included in an online section of the course, uh, the face-to-face -face section of the course, and the community lab section of the course. Also, definitely encourage you, uh, each and every one of you, to feel very encouraged to reach out to, uh, to myself, to Christy, and to Paula with questions that you have. You know, we have a fairly non-traditional way of designing courses and, and teaching them here. And, but the good news is, is that, uh, you know, we're a small institution, uh, we're very hands-on with our students and, and with, with each other as, as uh, co-employees and co-workers. So, you know, always feel encouraged to, to come to us and, you know, work something out. And like I said before, we're really happy to jump on a call like this and help you through um, a, a, a tricky situation or uh, help you sort out something that's confusing. Uh, it, are there any, you know, questions at this point or any comments from maybe from those uh, who are on the call who have been with us for a bit longer points of clarity or anything anyone would like to say at this point before we move into Moodle proper? Okay. All right. So now let's start talking about learning technology. I'm going to share my screen and take you on a tour of future generations Moodle. All right, I assume you can all see my screen now. Um, the first thing I want to make sure is that each of you 
who is on this workshop call and who is watching this video um, has a Moodle login. I know one has been created for you because I checked yesterday. Uh, you've also been assigned uh, that is enrolled in your courses for term four. And there have been templates, very basic templates made for each of your courses. Uh, if you are unable to log in because you do not have your username and or password, please let us know uh, and we will remind you of uh, your credentials and get you up to speed post haste. So this is uh, the Future Generations Moodle site. The address to access this site is moodle.future.edu. We also have an ePortfolio site that the students are using to generate ex relatively extensive ePortfolios for their practicum projects, and that is mahara.future.edu. Okay, so when, once you get, once you type in Moodle, <laughs> Moodle, sorry, that's the combination of Moodle and Mahara. Uh, Moodle.future.edu will take you to this login screen, enter your username and password, and log in. And you'll be taken to your dashboard, okay? So uh, this is really by default what you'll see. You'll see a list of the courses that you are enrolled in. Your list will look different than mine. I can't, this is really, let's see here, sorry. Hide everyone's faces here. You have a list of blocks down the right side that have various options for navigation through administration and course pages, a calendar. Um, and I would like to you know, start by sort of navigating you along the top of the screen here because there's a lot of uh, useful options here. Um, at, the, at the first, uh, the top left, you have basically your section. Um, you can add to your own profile and build that out if you like. Uh, you can look at your grade book from here. Uh, you can communicate with students uh, through Moodle directly. We tried this in term one, and uh, I believe that Mike Recklin did some communicating with students through Moodle uh, last term, actually this term, and he's been quite effective, I think. But for one reason or another, most of us have decided to continue using email to communicate with our students. So if you are gonna use the Moodle messaging feature, make sure you warn your students, let them know that you'll be using Moodle messaging and that you'll be available to receive messages through Moodle. Um, if you are you know, more interested in uh, just you know, using uh, the, the tried and true method of email and don't really wanna like, um, kind of reach out to this, this, this Moodle messaging, that, that's fine too. Uh, it's really uh, up to you. You can also log out from here. Um, I use this link quite a bit. This is gonna show you all of the courses that you're enrolled in. Um, I enrolled, you're, you're enrolled in your course, and then I enrolled everybody on this call, um, I think everybody, at least all of the new people, in uh, several additional courses yesterday. I enrolled them in, uh, some courses that are existing here at Future Generations, so you can look at existing courses and see what other faculty have done. And I also enrolled you in some training courses that are available, publicly available, um, through this open source technology and that I've uploaded to the site that will allow you to see what some other folks have done uh, in creating Moodle courses and uh, learn something about Moodle uh, at the same time. This is a direct link to Mahara, our ePortfolio site. I'm not gonna spend time going through uh, Mahara and you know, most of the work the students are doing in Mahara these days is related to their practicum project, but it would be good for you to understand what Mahara is and how these ePortfolios work. Um, I'm not sure if you've been given uh, Mahara login credentials yet, um, but if the class that you are teaching is gonna have a relatively high proportion of uh, multimedia assignments, if they'll be doing reports, if they might be doing videos or uh, audio recordings, these types of things, these are great to add to students' uh, e-portfolios and definitely encourage you to, um, to encourage your students to, to add the, the artifacts from your course to their, to their e-portfolios. These are, these are really great way um, for students to showcase themselves and their community uh, and the work they've been doing at Future Generations. I'm not gonna 
Uh, Go any further into the portfolios. Yeah. Uh, Jesse, can I just dive in here? Please, yes. This is, this is the first time we have done the e-portfolio. So we're still learning as faculty at, mm -hmm. and how to work it in. But one, one, I, one reason was to have an alternative to a long prose English written report as a final product in term four. Uh, having uh, many more alternatives for students to be able to showcase what they've learned in the in the program but we're still learning how to use it that's right we definitely had mixed results uh, there as with most new technologies there are some students who have, have taken flight and have really interesting uh, really deep portfolios that will certainly serve them well professionally in the future and there are others who just haven't seemed to be able to master the technology and, and really get their portfolios off the ground. So, you know, like all uh, technologies and, and new additions to curriculum, it's, it's a work in progress. Thanks, Dan. There's also a direct link here to JSTOR. Um, this is our university library. So all students have access to this and uh, they are using it to drive their, their research. These little icons up here uh, help you get around as well. This brings you back to your landing page. This brings you to a calendar. Um, anything that you put, uh, due dates that you put on assignments that you create uh, will appear on your calendar and your students' calendars. Uh, if there are generally, generally you, you know, university-wide events that are added to Moodle, they will appear on the calendar. They, they populate automatically. Students have been using the calendar pretty effectively, I think, to stay on track. So it's definitely good to be familiar with it. Badges, we don't use, uh, although I think we could in the future, especially for certificate courses. <clears throat> and then uh, this is a nice way to get to all the courses at future generations <clears throat> that are listed on Moodle. And this is where I'm gonna start taking you through, through some of the existing courses here that are already uploaded uh, on the Moodle site. Class of 2017, you know, it's, it's, it would probably behoove you to go ahead and just spend a little time browsing through some of these and see what other faculty have done. Uh, you'll be, have limited access to some and, and full access to others. Uh, if you go to my courses, you'll see which courses you have full access to. So you'll see each of these bins. We have, these are all of the term three courses. These are all of the term two courses that are on Moodle, term one, and here are the term four courses. I'm sure you'll see your course here. And there is a course template built for your course. So for instance, let's look at community managed disaster risk reduction and climate change adapt adaptation. That's a mouthful of a name. So what you'll see for your course is that a very simple course template has been created. As Christy mentioned, we have three phases to, the, to each course, an online learning phase, a residential phase, and the community lab phase. So it'll be your responsibility to build out each of these three sections with learning activities and learning artifacts. The course overview, there's a, a, a few elements that, that we require as well. Um, of course, your contact information. Uh, I wanted to highlight office hours. This is something we've been doing since term two, and it's been, somewhat successful. Uh, what we have been doing is each faculty member has been setting aside a couple of hours a week on a regular schedule and been sending out a Zoom link and been available in their office for students to come and discuss course related issues with them via Zoom like we're doing now. It's really it's very similar to a you know an in-person office hours. Uh, sometimes nobody comes, sometimes a few people come, but giving students an the ability to reach you face to face on a weekly basis um, has been, I think, uh, overall definitely worth it. So we really encourage you to, um, to pick some office hours and, and to stick with them even if you don't get a lot of participation every week. The best office hours based on time differences are generally about 8 to 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, I think the mine in term two were, were 9 to noon. Uh, on Wednesdays and you know for our students in Nepal uh, you know they're about ten and a half hours ahead so you can do the math and, and figure out that you know toward the end of that session we're getting pretty late into the evening 
Uh, but then you'll need a course description. Uh, I think each of your courses already has a description um, in, the, in the course catalog. So you can basically cut and paste that into here. Um, and then this is really important here. Uh, I wanna take a minute to stop and talk about program level learning outcomes. We have 33 program level learning outcomes, which are basically competencies that we want all of our students to have by the time they, they graduate from future generations. And you, uh, as a faculty member, are responsible for uh, browsing this list of 33 learning outcomes and selecting a subset of those learning outcomes that are relevant to your course. Okay, so, so we want to know which uh, subset of learning outcomes you will be addressing in your course. Now, this is a pretty typical in most universities to have, uh, you know, program or, 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 you know, sort of global learning outcomes or learning objectives ascribed to each course. But uh, at Future Generations, you know, over the last couple of years, we've been doing a lot more than just paying these lip service. Um, we've actually been assessing the degree to which student work demonstrates mastery of these learning outcomes. So at the end of each term, faculty submit a sample of student work and our direct assessment team uh, uses rubrics to evaluate that work uh, based on the program level learning outcomes that the work is supposed to be um, representing. And they make a determination to the degree to which the learning outcomes are represented in that work. Um, this has really given us, uh, a, I think, a leg up on, on our assessment process and really given us a lot of very valuable information so far about how well uh, are we are actually teaching the things that we think we're teaching. So one of the first things you should do when you're creating your, your course is to, to access that list of learning outcomes. Uh, it's available um, in the academic catalog. It's available at the website, uh, future.edu, uh, under academics. And there's this, this list is, is in multiple different places. If, if you have trouble accessing it, let Christy or I know, and we can certainly um, send it to you. Um, but yes. Uh, and, and also, sometimes people get really excited about their course and all of the wonderful content within, and they you know, pick maybe 12 or 14 different learning outcomes that are, are relevant. And while the enthusiasm is great, it's just really difficult to, to really address that many different learning outcomes uh, in one course. So we generally recommend between five and nine, maybe even five and seven is a better range. Uh, and you'll get an idea of what these learning outcomes look like here in just a minute when I show you uh, an example of an existing course. So in addition to the program level learning outcomes, we'd also want you to have some specific course goals, right? So the learning outcomes are more general, you know, the general program level competencies, and the course goals are specifically, uh, what are the goals for your course? What um, types of goals do you have for students in terms of their learning in your course, not at the program level? Uh, I'm gonna, hold off on describing these more until I show you some examples here in a moment. So then we have the online learning residential and lab sections, which I'll show you. Uh, and then a, a section at the bottom for learning resources. This, this is usually a list of, uh, of readings, uh, videos, other types of resources that students can, can access um, and use to enhance their learning experience. So I'm gonna go now, um, First, I'm gonna stop and ask you if you have any questions at this point before we start looking at some specific examples of filled in courses um, that I think will give you a lot more context and, and help you build out your, uh, your template. But at this point, does anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, I have, yeah, this is Sunny. That's Sunny, yes, go ahead. Yeah, so you show us the message system. Do we know whether the message system sends alerts to personal email? So like if I decide to use the message system mm -hmm. in Moodle, uh, will I receive alerts if there are new messages or my students will receive alerts in their private emails? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, if you send a message, uh, as long as that feature is, is turned on, and it should be, um, your student will receive uh, an email alert that says, you know, uh, Joseph Sani has sent you a message um, on Moodle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the only question. There has been, uh, I, I recall back in term two, there was a couple snafus with that with where, where uh, faculty were not getting 
notified when students sent them messages. So uh, it may be good to test that system in your course to make sure it's working. Okay. And if not, it's just a matter of a checkbox being checked that says, you know, send alerts uh, when messages are delivered. Okay. Yeah, I, I would check that system with a student via email just to make sure they're receiving yeah. it and then, and then you know. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, you, can also, you can also send from within Moodle in different places. You can send uh, an email to the students. You can click on it and, and just open up a dialogue and send them an email. Uh, okay, directly, the, in, directly in the private email, correct? Well, to their future, we're supposed to use their, the, their, their future generations email. Yeah, we'll go to their future generations email. Okay, thanks. All right, so let's put some context, apply some context to these templates. Uh, there are many options uh, that we could choose here uh, in terms of different courses that our faculty have created for the class of 2017. This is uh, Ruben and Isaac's class from term two. This is my practicum, practicum course, the social research methods. This is Christy and Jeff's course on graduate study foundations. And this was Micah Slife's course uh, on healthy people, healthy communities. So let's take a look at this course and see how Micah developed her course in Moodle. Um, and again, you know, following the, the successes of others uh, is, at least for me, and, and I hope for you too, will be probably the most, uh, the most useful um, set of learning resources for, for your Moodle education. So definitely spend some time with, with these courses. Here we see uh, Moodle, as, uh, Micah has uh, listed her contact information her office hours, and it's nice. She, she included a, her, the Zoom link to her office hours right here. Um, each of you will have access to our Zoom account, and you can create a link that, for our, a standing meeting. Hers are on Wednesday at 9 a.m. to noon, also by appointment. And in, in order for students to access her office hours, they simply have to come to the, the course page, click here, and they're directly linked to her. Really convenient. Course description, you can see here are her course level, course level uh, Learning, let's see, her course level learning goals. Doesn't look like she had, huh. Um, looks like I, I don't see that she has her uh, program level learning outcomes listed here. I'll show you those in a different spot. Um, but her course level learning goals are, you know, describe health behaviors, assess existing health assets, synthesize available evidence, evaluate the influence of national and regional trends. So these are very specific health-related outcomes that are relevant to her course. Uh, I'm gonna back out of this just for a second um, to show you So this is, this is how I would hope that, that you all would, would create um, your online course uh, in, the, in this section. Uh, and that is to list the program learning outcomes first. Uh, we have eight learning domains and then uh, specific learning outcomes under each domain. Okay, so this is my course. Uh, I chose seven uh, program level learning outcomes for my course in three domains. And I listed them at the top of the, the, top of the course template here. Okay, so you can see these are quite a bit more general than the course goals. Uh, but again, these are really important and we'll be coming back to them at the end of each semester and evaluating the degree to which student work uh, is, is representing these learning outcomes. And, and they should be the same in the syllabus. In other words, this is yes. essentially, uh, uh, essentially the same as you would have it in your syllabus, right? Exactly. It should be. Yep, yep. So there's a lot of options, uh, you know, for you on, on Moodle, and I hope that you will, you know, become familiar with the technology to the point where you enjoy building, you know, this, this course uh, within. Uh, it's really a powerful technology, um, uh, and you'll see that each faculty member has done it a little bit differently uh, within the template that's provided to them. Uh, Mike has uh, provided some frequently asked questions here to help her students, questions for office hours that her students have provided. You definitely want to post a copy of your syllabus. Um, we really suggest that you post a copy of the syllabus both in Word format and in PDF format. 
And the reason for that is just that one of the quirks of Moodle uh, is that if you post it in Word format and you click here, it will automatically download the Word document to your desktop. But if you click on a PDF, it opens it uh, within the existing window. And, that's, and some students who have limited access uh, at times to the internet have a difficulty downloading the syllabus every time and would prefer to have uh, the, the PDF. Something else nice that Micah has done has uh, provided a, a repository of, of recorded Zoom sessions for a course. I'm going to take just a minute to show you these. This is uh, something that is definitely optional um, that Micah did a really nice job doing, and that is uh, she used Zoom to record um, sessions with her students and just sessions uh, on her own um, teaching uh, various elements of the course, okay? So, uh, and then she downloaded, she uploaded them to YouTube and posted the links here so the students can come back at any time and review uh, office hours that um, have happened in the past, discussions that she's scheduled um, for different groups of participants, really nice set of learning activities and resources always at their fingertips. Okay, so now let's get in more to the meat of the course. Uh, these are the three sections, online learning, the residential experience, and the community lab. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, we're already nearing the end of the first hour here, um, but I just wanna you know, just show you briefly um, the kinds of learning activities uh, and resources um, that you can use um, to, to, drive, to drive learning in your course. One thing that's very important is uh, when you add assignments, right? When you, you create an assignment and you post it on your, your Moodle site, and this is something that students are going to, to complete and turn in. Anytime they're gonna turn something in, you wanna use a turn it in assignment, and it has this icon. Um, I'll show you in a minute uh, how to add that to your course. Um, but what this is, is this is basically a plagiarizing checking software program that we've used with uh, great success over the last two years to make sure that students aren't copying and pasting things from other places on the internet. Uh, there's been a, a, long, a long-standing problem with plagiarism in future generations. A lot of this is just because of cultural differences. Um, you know, in some cultures, uh, sort of cobbling together other people's work uh, is, is a lot more acceptable than it is uh, in, in, a, in a US program. And we definitely try to you know, make that very clear to students at the beginning that everything they turn in needs to be their own work. But what this does is when students submit work um, via Turnitin, um, they, uh, it automatically runs it through uh, a piece of software that compares it to every other document on the internet and gives them feedback as to whether or not they have submitted anything that is plagiarized. And then they have an opportunity to fix anything that is plagiarized and turn in something that's not uh, before faculty grade it. Uh, it's, really, it's really been a, a, a nice way to gently nudge students in the direction of always turning in original work. So again, when you're creating assignments, there's an option to do a Moodle assignment, um, but please choose a Turnitin assignment um, rather than a Moodle assignment. And I'm gonna quickly, I wonder if I can, oops. Of course. Anytime you're building your course, one thing that's really important is that you always have to turn editing on uh, in this button at the top left, and that will allow you to get in under the hood and, and change things. I'm going to show you just briefly um, how to add a turn in assignment or any other kind of activity or resource. Uh, in just a few minutes, Paula is going to go through and show you um, a little bit more about the different activities and resources you can use to build your course, which are listed here. But I wanted to show you first, just right here, here's a Turnitin Assignment 2. No one's really sure why they added the 2 to the end, but anytime you're using, creating an assignment, you want to click Add a res Resource, activity, Add an Activity or Resource, and then choose a Turnitin Assignment and add that to the course. Um, you do not want to use this type of assignment because that will not uh, have the plagiarizing checking capabilities that Turnitin does. 
Any questions about that? All right. You can all hear me still, right? Yeah, I had one question. Yeah, please. Uh, where was, where did you find that uh, add in uh, a turn in assignment? You brought down a drop screen, but where, how did you get it? Uh, how did we get the software originally, or, or where did I find yeah. it within turn uh, Just when you said, you know, you, you click something in order to bring down. Sure. The sure. menu. Go to add resource, Jesse. Where is it? It's right here. Um, so at the bottom of each of the uh, blocks, there's always an ag add activity or resource. Oh, okay. I got it. So this is where it is. Click here. And then that brings up the ability to, to add all sorts of different activities or resources, assignments, um, okay. and other, other types of resources that Paula will be talking about here in a few minutes. Okay. Minutes. Please, as I'm going along here, obviously, I'm sort of racing through a lot of this. There's so much more that could be covered than can be covered in the time we have allotted. So please, you know, slow me down, ask to me to reiterate um, things I've said. I, I appreciate that. Okay, so you'll see here uh, that in Micah's course, there were uh, multiple tracks. So her students were able to choose whether they want to talk about a global perspective on primary healthcare systems, on uh, health, health behavior change in communities, or self-development, or a student-directed track that where they actually got to pick their own, their own um, way through the course. And based on these, she created different assignments and different readings for each of the tracks. She used folders here to contain the readings. Uh, she also added forums for the students. Uh, we found that these have been really useful. Uh, these are asynchronous uh, conversations between students and faculty. Looks like Micah has, um, let's go ahead and see what she's done here. So this, is at the this was at the beginning of term two in July. In, in preparation for the first section, um, Please feel free to post questions on the ideas for discussion. And she sort of opened up the floor. And now we have students asking questions and Micah responding. This is really a nice way to, uh, to allow students to communicate with each other and to encourage interaction on an asynchronous schedule, right? Everyone has uh, different time zones and is on different schedules. So it's difficult to, to have elements of your course that are synchronous where students are together at the same time. Uh, our, our office hours and the occasional um, group session are really all we have in terms of synchronous sessions. Um, but this asynchronous forum feature uh, is, tends to be really effective. Um, Paul will talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. And, and uh, the submissions go to your email as well. Anything that you add in those, generally it's set up so that it goes to your email. So you're aware of a, of a dialogue going on even if you don't check in. Thank you, Dan. The next section here is the residential experience. Um, typically, the 20 points is assigned for uh, participation, uh, what we like to call earnest participation in the residential. The uh, regional academic directors who lead the, the residentials typically assign a number of points to each student um, based on their participation in the residential. Uh, students who, who attend the entire residential and, and participate in each activity typically get the full 20 points. Uh, so those 20 points go toward the residential section in each course. A lot of us gave options for students to, uh, to get extra points um, based on their residential experiences. So while they're on the residential, if they really just want to focus on the uh, on the, the different learning experiences and on the site visits and they don't want to worry about uh, doing any additional work, that's fine. They can pick up those 20 points by doing extra work in the community lab. But for those who are motivated to, to do on-site work and to do particularly applied assignments, then they can choose one of these. Um, you can click here and you can see here some instructions for 
how to do a residence, residential evidence use for health assignment. You see activities and artifacts listed here. And this is the, the faculty view. So you can see, they will see um, which students have turned this in. You can see some students chose to do this. The students will have a different view of this. When the students come to the assignment, they will see a place that allows them to submit the assignment um, rather than faculty view. So let me just show you that real quickly. This is really an, an, another important little uh, feature here. Um, when you're building your course, a lot of times you, you will want to maybe take a look at what the course looks like from the perspective of a student rather than your perspective because Moodle shows you different things depending on what your role is in the course. So if you go down here and say switch role to student, then now it'll show you exactly what your course looks like to a student. So if I go back to the residential evidence used for health, It'll now give me an opportunity to submit my paper down here. And once I do submit my paper, it'll populate these fields and tell me how much similarity. This is basically here is my, the percentage of, of my paper that is copied from some other source on the internet. And it'll also show me my grade once the faculty member is graded. it. Jesse, could I mention something about the optional residential assignments? Please also that I that I didn't say in the introduction another change we've made is that residentials are not required we we realize that 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 caused too many problems by discriminating against students from not being able to get visas or for things that come up where they just can't attend the residential and so also we we ask that faculty give an optional 20-point assignment in case students can't attend the residential so there's something that they can do to still be able to earn those 20 points and in that case you would be the one that would oversee those 20 optional residential points and and not the regional academic director thanks christy yeah. that's an important clarification So moving to the third, the community lab section of the course. Now this is the, this is the part of the course where students are expected to be actively engaged in their community. Prior to the class of 2017, um, students were sometimes engaging their communities throughout the curriculum and, and so other times they were really not actively engaging their communities until they started to do their practicum research. And because this is a, a degree in applied community change and we are first and foremost an applied program uh, the faculty decided to add a, se a section to each course that compelled students to get involved in their communities and to apply their learning uh, on at, at street level so to speak so the goal, really the, 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 you know, the overall goal is for students to to learn fundamentals in this section to experience an applied learning um, at the residentials and then to come home from the residentials and to go and to apply that learning from the first two sessions, the first two sections in their own communities. And you'll see what Mike has done here is given students options for different assignments, uh, different lab assignments based on the tracks that they've chosen. Okay, so if you've chosen the policy and advocacy for help track, you can get 20 or 40 points for this uh, assignment based on the scope the, uh, of the assignment. Um, again, you click here and it'll give you a description of the assignment. It'll tell you the activities involved, the artifact that you need to submit, develop some advocacy materials in a format that are relevant to your community and stakeholders. And then it'll tell you what is expected for a 20 point assignment versus a 40 point assignment. Okay, 40 point assignment requires the options above plus a dissemination of the materials in your community. Pretty clever. And then along with each of these community projects, Micah has included a folder of materials to drive the project, okay? Creating policy briefs and translating evidence and examples of policy briefs. So those are the three major sections in each course. 
Um, I definitely encourage you to go, as I've said a couple times now, and look through the existing courses that uh, I've enrolled you in and see how different faculty have approached building out each of these three sections and, and also, of course, the introductory session. Um, at the bottom, there's always a space for additional course resources. These are sort of general resources that can, uh, can, can supplement students' learning in, in any section. Uh, we've got additional resource documents, uh, web links to additional learning resources, et cetera. So again, I've enrolled you in each of these courses. I'm just gonna give you a very, very brief tour through to the other courses. This is uh, Ruben and Isaac's course. What you'll see here is uh, they've taken a, a very detailed approach, um, a lot of text. Um, they've really, they really dug in and you can see here their program of learning outcomes. They're ones, a group who chose a lot of learning outcomes and they actually did a pretty good job of covering them, believe it or not. Uh, course level learning outcomes. They talk about three phases of the course. And then uh, they had an orientation session here. And then they start digging into um, the specific uh, tracks of their course. They, have a lot, they decided to you know, list learning resources in each section, specific study guides, et cetera. Um, my course, on uh, social research methods was much simpler. Um, I listed a number of course documents at the top, just basic course documents, some guides on writing the practical method statement, which was the, the summative document that came out of this course, um, the proposal form for a student-directed lab project. And you can see uh, in, each, in each section, I've, I've outlined the learning activities and the learning artifacts for each activity and the number of points they can earn. Distinguish between required and optional activities. And then listed some additional learning resources at the bottom of the, of the course page. And then just to complete this little tour of term two. You can also look at, at the term three courses. Um, I'm more familiar with the term two courses because I was a faculty member during this course. Here at Christy and Jeff's course, you see they also have their learning outcomes and learning goals, the online learning. They had two tracks. You could either have um, really dig into Wikipedia and writing a Wikipedia article about your community or um, choose to go down the path of community mapping. They also chose a pretty simple layout, and here are their different course, they have actually have a lot of course resources available. Okay, so that's really about all the time we have for, um, in terms of uh, going over uh, existing courses and the course templates. Um, I want to spend just about five minutes on showing you how to start building a course. Um, and then uh, we're gonna look at some external learning resources and then I'm gonna turn it over to Paula. So this is where you will start, right? All of you have a, a template for your Moodle course. First thing you do is turn editing on. And then you'll see in the bottom corner of each of these boxes, you have an add activity or resource button, right? So. If you want to add, say, your syllabus to the top of this box, you can click and add a file, okay? If you wanted to add a book that you've written that students can have, have access to, um, you can do that here. You can use labels to further organize your sections. Paul will dig in a little bit more deeply to these options. But really everything drives from this add an activity or resource button. Also very important is to become familiar with the navigation, uh, navigation boxes on the right side of the screen. 
Um, this is basically a general navigation for the site. This will allow you to get around the courses that you are uh, a, a part of. And then the course administration box allows you to, uh, to do a variety of different things in your course. You can see who's enrolled in your course. Uh, as far as I know, we will enroll students in your course for you, but it still may be useful for you to go and see all the people who are in your course. You can see right now in this, uh, we have Isaac, who is teaching this course enrolled. We have Christy, who is the head of the, the class. And then we have each of the, research, the uh, regional assistant uh, directors enrolled so they can uh, sort of keep track of their students' work in the course. You can access your grade book. You can switch your role. And then this is another uh, important item here. Um, and I think if you spend a little time with the you know, various Moodle training resources that I'll show you here in a minute, uh, either the Moodle videos or the written um, training documents, uh, you can find out a lot about the different blocks that you can add. Um, if you want to um, add, for, for instance, uh, some HTML to your site, if you want to to add uh, a space where your students can make comments about the course to the, to the course page, you can do that. Um, to this point, our faculty have not used additional blocks that much. Um, this is sort of uh, an intermediate uh, Moodle user feature uh, where most of us are, are sort of advanced beginners. Uh, but there's a lot of options here for adding different, different blocks and different features to your course. And this is something that if you want to to meet with myself uh, and or Paula in a, a next session and start to dig down into more options that are available to you, we can start talking about some of these specific uh, blocks and how they could, uh, how they could add um, to your course and how they could make the learning experience richer for your students. Okay, I'm going to stop there in terms of our Moodle site and I'm gonna ask you if you have any questions or comments before I show you some training materials uh, that can get you started on really digging in and learning how to use some of the features that are available. So anything at this point? All right, well, thank you for your continued attention here. Um, I want to show you two very important sources of Moodle training materials. You know, really at any university uh, that uses an LMS, whether it's Canvas or Moodle or anything else, it's generally the responsibility of the faculty member to get up to speed on that learning platform. And while we have resources here to help you do that, really it's your responsibility to, to learn as much as you can, especially if you're the person building the course site, about, about the, the Moodle system and to sort of teach yourself a bit about how to use it. So really the best place to do this, if you're into somebody uh, who who likes to, to read rather than watch, um, and when you're troubleshooting problems is docs.moodle.org. And I will send some essential links out to you after this workshop, including this one. This is the main page of docs.moodle.org. Something that I found really useful when I was beginning to learn uh, was this teacher quick guide. You spend about an hour, it'll really give you a lot of information about how to set up your course. Okay. Talks to you about gradebook for assignments and quizzes, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, you know, and then of course, there's lots of internal links where if it's, you're talking about assignments, it'll bring you to the assignment activity and then tell you how you can create different kinds of assignments. Um, the activities here, let me go back to, so we don't get, lost here. So this is the teacher quick guide. Also this managing a Moodle course menu over here to the right is very useful. Um, if you're ready to add some activities to your online course or some resources or some new blocks, you wanna do that, um, simply click these links and Moodle will tell you how you can act, access and add all of these different types of activities. If you wanted to follow my advice and add a forum to your course that allows participants to have asynchronous discussions, you can click here 
and it'll tell you all about the different types of forums and how to add them to your course, okay? Forum settings, using the forum, forum FMQ, if you need more help. A lot of times they will actually add direct links to videos um, that will show you how to do this uh, for, uh, in a different format. So this is just a, oops, just a great resource that is provided by Moodle itself, so you know it's legit. Um, that will allow you to really, and, and even if you just go to Google and you search, you know, Moodle, how to create an assignment, it will almost always take you to this page first. It will almost always take you to docs.moodle.org because this really is the best place uh, to find vetted information about creating your Moodle course. Okay. I don't really think there's any reason to go outside of the Moodle Docs wiki uh, for, for written tutorial content. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, how I learned to use Moodle was basically by watching YouTube videos. Um, there are some really great videos out there. Sometimes they're designed for the faculty at specific organizations. So they might say, you know, well, welcome Johns Hopkins faculty. This is, you know, your guide to learning, to, to using Moodle 3.0. Um, but really, once they get into the substance of the discussion, I find that it tends to be a really steep learning curve. Um, so, I, you know, I just typed in Moodle tutorial for beginners here into YouTube, and there are many options. One that uh, I watched and found to be very useful uh, was this. The version of Moodle that we use is actually Moodle 3.0. Um, but if you watch an, a Moodle 2.9 tutorial or another version, it's going to be really very similar. They just sort of add um, some, you know, new features to each uh, to each upgrade. But generally, if you're somewhere in 2.5 or above, you're going to find that the videos are very relevant and the content is um, is very useful. Um, this is a particular video that I watched and um, you need a website. Why not do it yourself? And found. Uh, your own professional website. Very useful to me. Um, so, you know what these are like. He basically goes through a variety of um, stages of starting with your template and building it out by using different activities and resources. Really useful. And you can, you know, search for things that are much more specific. If you want to use the lesson feature that Paula will talk to you about in just a minute, here we have 2.9, configuring using the lessons in Moodle. There are literally hundreds of YouTube videos, some short, some long, that can really get you up to speed quickly on how to use Moodle. Okay. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to hand it over to Paula. Um, Paula is now going to dig in a little bit more into specifically um, the types of activities and resources that are available to you through Moodle and that you can use to build your course templates. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to give one more chance for anybody on this session to ask questions or any of you who have been with us for a while and have used Moodle to maybe add something that, that I've forgotten that is really important for somebody who is just being introduced to Moodle. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah, I note that uh, when I clicked on to get, on to get online here, it opened up Chrome. Does this have to be done in Chrome or can it be, uh, can I use other browsers? Uh, you, can use, you can use a different browser if you like. Um, Certainly using, uh, you know, we wouldn't recommend that you use uh, like, you know, an older browser um, like, like Netscape or something um, or Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer tends to be fraught with bugs, okay. but uh, Chrome, Firefox, or Safari, yeah. any of those should, should work just fine. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? All right. So I'll stop. Uh, I, would, I would just I would just add that um, that uh, 
we used to do use uh, Moodle more as an information repository, but we didn't um, we didn't have students submit their work here, and we didn't manage the grade book here. Now we're all students have to submit their work here on Moodle, so it's permanently stored, and the grades are handled through Moodle. And I found my breakthrough was when I was really able to use the grade book properly, and because um, that's how, that's kind of the connection with the students. They're checking their grades, um, and um, so so I recommend really understanding now how the how the grid because since since you're using Turnitin and Turnitin is not strictly Moodle, um, there is that there they have two different grade books or two different steps, and so I recommend working that out on uh, spending some time on that because um, it's important to the students that their grades be clear and straightforward yeah thanks dan that that that's important um turn it in is well integrated with moodle so anytime you grade something and turn it in it will automatically export that grade to your grade book um and i actually realized that i just forgot to show you one section so let me spend just a couple more minutes here paula <laughs> Could I, I don't know if you're doing the grade book. I'd like to reiterate what Dan said though, is that part of, part of this student directed learning is giving students a dashboard so they're not, they know how they're doing. And that's the, what the grade book feature does is so students can go, if you keep the grades up to date, students can go into that at any given time and know how they're doing in the course. Uh, we found that to be quite helpful and important for them. Exactly. Uh, I wasn't going to dig into the grade, the grade book today. Um, that's sort of the next level, but let me just take a couple minutes to give you a, a really brief overview. Um, so what I did uh, is I went to my course and, and I clicked on grade, grades right here. And this will bring you to your grade book. Um, there's a few different options here. Uh, there's a lot of different options. Really what you want is it to, this is usually the by default grader report is checked. Um, and that's what you want. And this basically shows you your whole grade book for the course, okay? Um, any activities that you've created, or excuse me, any assignments that you've created will be listed here. If you create an assignment, Moodle knows that that's something that students will be submitting and it will create a column in your grade book for it. Anybody who's enrolled in your course will be listed here on the right. Now we've already gone in and uh, change the grade book options to a natural grading scheme. And what that basically means is that uh, because we use this point system where each activity is, is uh, or, or I should say each artifact uh, assignment is worth a certain number of points, when you grade, um, it's definitely best just to grade in terms of number of points that the student has earned out of the number of points that are possible. So when I showed you the different examples of assignments. You saw that some of those assignments were worth 10 points, some are worth 20, some may be up to 40 points. Um, when you're grading, um, you just grade in terms of the number of points that the student earned out of the number of points that were available, okay? So you can see here that this uh, participatory research methods um, assignment was worth 10 points, and I've assigned a number of points to each student. Most students got close to full credit on this. And then, the way that this works is that Moodle will just basically add up all of the columns and give you a course total at the end, okay? So by the end of the course, all of the assignments that you've graded and turned it in, the grades will export to the Moodle, to the columns in your grade book. Moodle will add up the points across the, the semester and give you a course total for each student. Dan, is there anything else that you want to add about the grade book? I know you've had your, uh, you've, you've wrangled with it quite a bit. Anything else that would be useful for the new faculty to know at this point? Uh, all right. Okay, uh, I'll move on then. Um, there's one thing that uh, I forgot to show you, and but I told you I would, and I'm glad I remembered. This will just take a couple minutes. 
But this, under the faculty resources section, so you can find it by going to all courses and going to faculty resources, or you can find it by going to my courses because I've enrolled all of you in these, these educational courses. Um, these are basically courses that are publicly available uh, and they basically demonstrate how to use different aspects of Moodle. Uh, and they you know, are actually Moodle courses. So you, you sort of learn how to use Moodle from inside the framework of Moodle itself. So this is, uh, you can just basically browse these like you can browse uh, the courses of other faculty. And you can see this is basically a course on how to design an online course, <laughs> sort of an inception thing. Um, and you can see the different types of activities uh, and resources that this professor has used to teach the process of building an online course. Uh, this is um, a course on using Moodle. Um, you can see here, um, this is you know, based on uh, uh, a group from Hofstra. But there's really a lot of uh, nice resources here that'll allow you to learn about um, different activities and resources. Um, if you come, for instance, here to the activities block, it's gonna give you a how-to guide on lessons, assignments, folders, quizzes, the gloss, how to build a glossary, etc. So if you'd like to learn how to use these activities from inside a Moodle course, there's some options for you there as well. Um, this is kind of interesting. This is uh, a course uh, that basically prepares students for a, uh, a hypothetical trek to Mont Blanc, while at the same time um, showing different aspects of Moodle that are available to you. Ways you can post videos, links to outside information, PDF files, etc. So again, these are for your exploration. Um, and you're certainly not compelled to use these, uh, res these faculty resource courses, um, but they may be of use to you. So please feel encouraged to explore them. Okay. All right, that's all. Um, so let's turn it over to Paula and uh, Paula will help you get further oriented with the resources and activities that are available to you while building your course. All right, I'm going to go share my screen. Mm. Okay. When starting on the activities and resources, you just first have to go to your class and click turn editing on. From there, you can, in any of these um, topic sections, there is an add an activity or resource button. If you click it, it will bring up all of the options that you have. Um, I have a PowerPoint now to show what some of the different options are. So. The assignment option allows a teacher to communicate tasks, collect work, and provide grades and feedback. These are good to use when you are not using Turnitin. Um, you can use the assignments for things like turning in video assignments or spreadsheets, um, just not for papers or anything big like that. Mm -hmm. The big blue button is their form of Zoom. Um, for this, we will use Zoom, but if you ever have a problem with Zoom, you always have the option of using the big blue button. Um, it's just basically a video chat, or you can do it with or without video. Um, the chat, which Jesse kind of talked about, along with messaging. Um, it allows the students and the teacher to talk back and forth, kind of like Facebook Messenger kind of thing. Um, you can do group chats or just a one-on-one -on -one thing. Um, the checklist allows teachers to create a to-do list or a task list for their students, and then they, the students can check it off once the, the work is done. The choice activity allows a teacher to ask a question. 
and offer different possible responses. Um, they, the responses can be published after a certain date or not at all, and they can be published with or without student names if you're just trying to do it to get some background information and not want to give out personal information about a specific student. The database allows participants to create, maintain, and search a collection of entries. Um, it, they can include a checkbox, drop-down menu, text area, URL, picture, or upload a file. The external tool allows students to interact with learning resources and activities outside of Moodle. So with that, you can link any website or anything like that. Feedback allows the teacher to create a customer survey for collecting feedback from students using a variety of different question types. Um, and those results can also remain anonymous or can be shown with names. The forum enables participants to have an asynchronous discussion, um, like the student or the teacher could open up a forum and leave it open. Um, in the Moodle class that Jesse and I took, they had one, and it was just open all the time for any questions that you might have. You can post, and then any student can answer, and the teacher can answer back as well. Um, the glossary lets the students add in definitions as they go along. If they have a word that they have a question about and then they find the answer to, they can add it in the glossary and it'll always be there. Um, the lessons are like assignments, but you have more options. Um, you can deliver content or practice activities in um, flexible ways. You can Hmm. Depending on your student's choice of answer, you can make it go. You know, if the answer is correct, then they can go on to the next page. If it's wrong, it'll take it can take them back. So they have to reread and try it again. Um, the questionnaire allows students allows the teacher to construct surveys using a variety of question types. Um, it just kind of gathers more data for you to use. The quiz is like your only option, your one of your only options for putting in a test. Um, you can do it, there's various types you can use. They can be attempted multiple times with the question shuffled or randomly selected, or you can only allow the students to take it once, or you can only allow them to take it so many times. And if you allow them to take it multiple times, it will always choose the highest grade. Surveys provide a number of verified instruments that are useful in assessing and stimulating learning in online environments. Wiki enables participants to add and edit a collection of web, page, web pages. They are, the history is always kept. You can always see that and you can publish it or keep it personal for you to look at. You can always see what the students um, edit in that. Um, the workshop enables it the collection, review, and peer assessment of students' work. They can submit any digital content and are assessed by using a multi-criteria assessment form defined by the teacher. So you get to make that up on your own. And the resources, um, the book resource is really helpful if you have like a really long lesson or you have a lot of things you want the students to read. You can go in and create a book that has it can have chapters and sub chapters and media files as well um, files you can upload any files from your computer you can upload a folder it can also you can also upload a zipped folder and then unzip it so if you have like multiple things you want to upload you can you can do that all at once and then unzip it once it's in moodle um, the label um, allows text and multimedia to be inserted into the course page between links to other resources and activities. The page um, enables the teacher to create a web page resource using the text editor. Um, it can display pretty much any anything you want it to. And then the URL will link to anywhere. It can be a home page or it can be a specific page or a YouTube video. I would know if you Link it to a YouTube video, then it will um, show a little picture of the video where you put the link. And that is pretty much all of those. Uh, does anybody have any questions about any of them?
All right, Paula, <clears throat> got anything else? That was great, thank you. Nope, that was all. Okay, um, good. So this is just, uh, a, you know, a, a, obviously a, an overview um, to, get you, to get you started with your course construction. Um, a couple things I wanted to mention following up on Paula's presentation are uh, <clears throat> based on um, the different, <clears throat> excuse me, the different activities and resources that she just uh, outlined. The file resource uh, tends to be a lot more common and useful than you think. Um, anytime you want to, you know, for instance, upload your syllabus or you want to upload a PDF or <clears throat> some other type of file for students. Most of those learning resource lists that you see at the bottom of the page, those are created by adding files. Um, so anytime you want to upload some kind of document, use the file resource. And then the other uh, activity I wanted to mention was the lesson activity. This, this is a really powerful activity that allows you um, to create sort of a journey of learning in, within your course. Again, this is a, a, an intermediate to advanced <clears throat> intermediate option, uh, and it takes a little bit of doing to, to understand how to use it. Um, Luke Taylor Eyed here is, is our local uh, <laughs> expert at using the lesson. Um, as you'll see, basically none of the classes so far have used the lesson option. Uh, but what it does, uh, and, and if you are brave, a little bit brave, and you want students to have a, a more enriched experience within the context of Moodle, you can use the lesson activity to have students basically interact with different types of learning resources, uh, make choices, and uh, follow a, a path through a variety of artifacts. You can integrate quizzes. Um, you can have them watch videos read different types of materials, um, and really have more of a classroom type experience within Moodle, um, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, really a, a, a powerful option. I also have an outline with all of the, a little like blurb about all of the different activities and resources I can send out to you all the term four faculty. Great. Sounds good. That'd be great. Thanks, Paula. Okay, well, um, we're right on time here. It's 10.30 plus. Um, what we have scheduled for the last half hour uh, is potentially just a, an open workshop session. Uh, it would be great to hear any general questions that the new faculty have about Moodle, about the course design, about future generations in general. Um, this is your chance to uh, get some input from those of us who have been around for a while. Um, I noticed that uh, Micah has joined the call. Welcome, Micah. And uh, we have a few other old timers here. Uh, so this is also an opportunity for those of us who have some experience to, um, to present any gems of wisdom we may have about Moodle or about learning technologies or about teaching in general. Um, if, if, we, if we have some content we want to talk about here for the next 20 minutes, that's great. If we don't, um, we can end a little early. Um, so I will uh, turn it over to the group. Um, but before I do, uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, based on the last 90 minutes, if you're a new faculty member, you may be feeling a little bit overwhelmed by all of the different options that Moodle has to offer. <clears throat> just remember that this session was based uh, on getting you oriented to Moodle and getting you uh, oriented to the options that are available for you to start learning about um, the different options that are available for building your course. Remember that there are a lot of in-house resources that are available to you as you pursue your course development process. Uh, please reach out to myself if you have any big picture questions uh, about your course. If you have more technical questions, you know, uh, how, do I, how do I work with this particular activity or this particular resource, we suggest that you go to Paula first. She's the person who is really our troubleshooter and can help you through any traffic traffic jams that you get stuck in. Um, and if you have any, you know, really big picture questions about uh, future generation policies or how to construct the course, um, you know, uh, from uh, you know a twenty thousand foot foot level, um, then you probably want to go to Christy because uh, she's the, the the head of the. The, the class of 2017.
And as I mentioned, I'm very happy to meet with any of you individually for a session. Uh, what I would recommend is that you start building your class. Um, well, first you should engage some of the learning activities uh, that I recommended, watch some YouTube videos, read through Moodle docs, look at some existing courses, start building your course. And if you find that uh, an hour with me uh, and Paula would be useful, um, do you find yourself getting stuck? Please reach out, we'll schedule an hour and we'll help you build out the elements of your course that uh, you're having trouble with or help you add some additional depth uh, where it's needed. So with that, I'll turn it over to the group. Um, anybody have questions or any of the old timers have some comments or advice that they would like to parlay to the rest of the group? Jesse, I have a comment. Go for it. Um, I would ask folks, um, as we move in the next semester, especially the next class, a little more towards peer learning and, and experiment with that. Um, please don't ignore the value or the usefulness of synchronous communications. Uh, if you have students working in pairs, have them looking at each other, like, you know, like we're doing today, except for me. Um, and again, this is not as much of a directive as, as to say, keep this in mind because we're going to be doing more of that, especially in the next class. We're experimenting with it now with some peer learning activities in a few classes. So uh, while you're designing your class or redesigning your class, keep in mind that it's not a bad idea to have students getting to know each other um, over Zoom or Skype or whatever they would like to do, that they could actually be in the same place together looking at each other if the computer is the same place. So just a note. Yeah, th thanks, Eric. I think that's a good reminder. And especially there are a few courses that won't have a residential presence because of the nature of the, the, the brevity of the residential two weeks. We can't have a significant residential presence for all the courses. And so that, that type of engagement online, trying to find a way to do it via Zoom or other ways online or with students in their communities is especially important for classes that, that won't have that residential president. president. Right. And, and as we go forward into next year and such, uh, this might in, in a greater manner constitute um, the, the residential portion of the curriculum. So. Right, thanks. That's all. What else? Well, I, I, I'd like to add, it's not exactly Moodle, except that when you set up the Moodle, you'll have to put deadlines. And something that, um, that, that, that I've learned, uh, that Mike Recklin did this at the beginning of term three, and, I've, and I have done it with the course we're teaching in this term now. We, uh, each course is going to have roughly one month online, and that's not very much time to get all the content that you might like at the graduate level. And so it has always been a problem that if students didn't meet the deadline, um, then, then it all got, you know, it all got kind of uh, uh, delayed and moved forward. And this was particularly worse for courses that were starting later in the term. The first, the, the courses started at the beginning of the term, um, and the students didn't finish those courses and or some students didn't finish those courses so they were beginning the, the next courses later and what Mike Recklin did was to set it up so that he would promise feedback within 48 hours if the students turned their work in online and everybody was turning their work in and so we did this with our with the sustainable livelihoods course and I won't say everybody but basically everybody that is that is that is that is seriously turned their assignments in ahead of time or on time, which meant that you can schedule your own grading time around that. And that the whole idea of submissions and grades, it just got, it gets so much easier when it's, um, when it's, um, um, when students are turning it on and you're getting the feedback. So um, just to think about scheduling your assignments in such a way that you can also schedule or the submission so that you can schedule your own grading time and get that quick feedback. It has made it, it just makes the work for everybody a lot less, in my opinion, compared to, to uh, eight cohorts. 
That's a very important point, Stan. Thank you. Uh, I just want to comment that I am participating in this session, but my understanding is that a TA is going to be assisting me in setting up the Moodle. Right? Yeah, Henry, I, I was hoping that James would be on this. He is still planning on doing it. We're recording it. And so uh, James will, I'll, I'll get in touch with him and then we will have a meeting with James and you and Ben, I think that that meeting has been scheduled. I need to go back and confirm it. But um, yeah, thank you for being on this, uh, Henry, to get the overview and, and we'll be in touch with James to, to provide the Moodle framework. Okay, nothing's been scheduled for as far as I know. Okay, yeah, we had, a, I'll, I'll get back to you on that uh, and confirm it at time. Sonny. Other comments or questions? Oh, yes, yeah, Sonny, you have something? Yeah, so just a quick, um, I mean, thank you for the session. It was, I mean, as you can imagine, a lot of information and it's a little bit of awareness yes. on my side here, frankly. <laughs> but uh, so I was just wondering your availability as I develop my course, will I shoot you an email and then we take like four questions? Sorry, Sonny, you're you seem to have frozen. Maybe if you turn off your, you, you, you froze up. Could you turn off your video and ask your question again? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sonny, we could hear you. Um, ah, okay, good. You can hear me. Okay. Yes. I, yeah. If I'm having this problem in the U.S., I can imagine what's going on in Ethiopia. So, <laughs> so I was just checking your availability in terms of uh, like having maybe a private session. Maybe I, I will try as much as I can to play around with it and design sessions. But uh, uh, maybe in May, I was just checking your availability or even before. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're available uh, a, a few different ways. Um, you can always shoot an email to myself or to Paula, or, or actually to both of us. You can put us both on an email if you have uh, sort of a one-off question or you'd like some advice. Yes. Uh, anytime, we can get back to you usually the same day. And if you would like to schedule uh, a session, which we definitely encourage in um, April or May, um, April probably would be better. <laughs> you know, um, Christy, do you know when when the deadline is to have these courses up? We, we, so we'd like to have a draft syllabus by, by May 1st and then have the, the Moodle, uh, a, a draft Moodle set up by June 1st because courses start July 1st. These are drafts so that we can continue to interact with you on them. If you feel like it's more helpful for you to first develop the Moodle site, then the syllabus sometimes I know that Luke has found that more helpful. So it, it just depends on whether, they're, because they're essentially both the same framework, the, yeah. the syllabus and the Moodle so, site. So maybe it's more helpful for, to do the Moodle site first and then the, and then the syllabus. But at, at any rate, we, we, that, that's why we're having this session so early so that you can be thinking early on it because of the, some of the complexities and the, and the, the, uh, I, the, the new aspects of this course, it's, we, we just want to be able to see things as, as they go on instead of just say, okay, things need to be up July 1st. And, and, um, and we just, it's not that we don't trust you to be working on it. It's just that um, because uh, things, we have so many different moving parts, it's just helpful to see things as they, they evolve. So. Yeah. Yeah, I understand you by an iterative yeah. process. So I think yeah. April, I'll, April, I will start working on it. So, yes. Great. That, that's great. Good. When, yeah. when you're ready for a one on one session, just reach out and we'll put something on the books. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, anyone else who's watching this video and has made it this far, uh, I encourage anyone <laughs> to do the same. Um, we're, we're always available either by email uh, or for a, a Zoom session. So I what also else? just want to thank you for a very informative workshop. I've learned quite a bit, and I'm actually um, quite excited to, to get started. 
Um, but in just sort of that last example, I'm curious from from you all and, and the, those that have, have experienced, how do you handle some of the internet, possible internet complications uh, when working in the middle of a class with the, with the students that we're working with? I, I, I can say one in relationship to Zoom, we, one thing that we have done is in a synchronous Zoom session, if we want to have a class session via internet, we haven't required it that students be on in a synchronous way because sometimes, for example, in Ethiopia, I think they had full periods where the internet was cut off. And so they were able to access in different ways, but not always synchronously. So you can require that they listen to a video, but as far as being on at the same time, uh, it, it's a little tougher to require that. So that's one way we address it. Uh, another way is to, to post assignments in advance enough that, that they can anticipate maybe outages or, or difficulties with internet access or they go to the field so they don't have access. So if things are posted in advance and they can anticipate that. But we do require students to, to communicate. I mean, that's one of the most important things is that if they think there's going to be a way or will have an outage, then they communicate with a faculty member that says, hey, I, I'm you know, I'm going to be away or I, so, so, or we're having difficulties with internet in Ethiopia and so I can't communicate right now. Or I won't be able to access this session or, or something like that. Um, well, one, one thing that, that living here in the Bolivian Amazon, I was always, even, I had worse connectivity than most students a lot of the time. So I was all, always mindful of, of that, of that limit. Now, the connectivity is getting better all around the world, but um, I would say that for most of the content, what I try to do is make it so that a student, when they've got good connectivity, can come in and download the information that they need and then work offline um, and then upload it when they have good connectivity again. Um, now, if you've got, if you want to have that, um, uh, I was just seeing that uh, workshop, uh, option, Jesse, is a possibility for us uh, in the next term since uh, for, for students doing presentations and, and then having a, a framework for feedback to it. Yeah. Um, that would require some synchronous, but we might think of having smaller groups that, that would be required at a certain time. Everybody could come in, but certain group, but so there are, there are, we want to be experimenting with more ways of doing the synchronous uh, communication as as our residentials are, as our residentials are getting more uh, shorter and, and more difficult to attend uh, but the content and and most of the participation for the students I find it's best if it's designed in such a way that they can they can do it when they've got connectivity um, both to, to get the information and then to upload their submissions and not require them to have uh, long periods of good connectivity so um, I want to address it. Sani uh, has a very good question that it looks like it just went to me privately about JSTOR. JSTOR is our our research or library online library resource, and uh, it's it's not perfect. We have about three collections there. It's it's really expensive to get the same type of access that you know a major university would have, but we do have it. To get on, you can go. You can access through Moodle or through JSTOR. The uh, I could send to all of you. The, I think it's um, Future Gen is the uh, um, ID, and then Researcher is the password. I think I need to. I I think that's it. But I can send that to to all of you, and that gives you access to JSTOR. If you don't have access to a major university, I'm a student at WVU also, and so if you want to get a certain kind of resource, let me know, and I could probably access it through through my um, WVU account also. So, uh, and then there are other ways, of course, Google Scholar, things like that, to be able to get research. That we're in the middle of a discussion about that to the, to find the best type of online resources for our students and our faculty, and um, it's it's kind of cobbling together different options. Great, thank you for answering Sonny's question. Yeah. Does anyone else have questions or comments? 
before we wrap up here. Yeah, again, so Sani, especially Sani, um, Andrea, and Henry, I'll be getting together with contacting you individually just about course specific issues concerning, uh, you know, residential and things like that. So. Yeah, 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 because I think we have plans have changed. Right? Plans have changed. Yeah, we had a great schedule and, <laughs> and now the, the residential, the, as far as I know, I'm, I'm, you know, in the middle of conversation with that. As far as I know, though, the outside dates are about well, we've shortened it a bit to 15 full days there. And so, so we need to talk about availability issues, especially Sonny with you and, and Henry. All right. Thanks. So, <laughs> yeah. Looking forward to the conversation. <laughs> oh, good. Me too. Uh, there was, a, there was a uh, conference on African trade at you know, some University of California. And the, the news came out yesterday. And not a single African got a visa to attend. Wow. One. And so we, just a little bit note, I think you have all received profiles of our students, but the way that we recruited was in three regions. And so we have, we had the East Africa region and the Himalayan region, which includes India, Arunachal Pradesh, India, and Nepal, and the Appalachian regions, which includes two students. And so the, the greatest part of the student body is from Africa, so that would be Ethiopians, Somalians who have Ethiopian passports, I think, but they still live and work in Somalia, a couple of them, uh, two Ugandan students and one from Sudan. And so certainly we, uh, even though Ethiopia is not on the travel ban, just like what Dan said, I, I think that we, we have already had difficulty getting the Ethiopians into the US and so we just can't imagine what it would be like now. Hey, Micah, you, you put your picture on. Can you introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, hi, Micah. Yeah, I just wanted to say hi. Um, I'm Micah Schleif. I um, just finished my doctoral degree at Johns Hopkins at the School of Public Health. And I'm an assistant professor here at Future Generations and also direct the, our research strategy. I'm currently working on a multi-country peace building study with a number of our current students and alumni and our partner USIP, uh, which is really exciting. And we've got a number of other ideas and, and, and proposals and things in the works um, in terms of research. And um, I think in terms of, of Moodle and courses, um, I just wanted to again put a plug in that I think all of us here are really happy to help um, as you're working on getting your courses set up um, and I just wanted to encourage you all there's a, there's definitely a little bit of a learning curve but I think once you get the hang of it um, uh, it's it can be fun um, and I think the students really appreciate um, when when content is presented as simply and clearly um, as possible um, and you know also appreciate um, visuals and creative stuff mixed in there so that it um, so that it stays fun and kind of alive so um, yeah if there's anything we can help with I really encourage as much as possible to test things ask um, any of us to look over stuff and see how it works um, uh, you know, feel free to, to ask Paula to look at, you know, deadlines and just double check things so that um, we try to avoid uh, confusion or whatever, because that ends up adding a lot of time and frustration on everybody's part. So uh, let us know how we can help. And um, it's been great to see the progress that we've made with Moodle over the last year and a half or so. So um, hopefully we'll keep on getting better. Thanks, Micah. Christy. Yeah. I want to add that uh, Ben Lazar is going to be in the Philippines. The reason he wanted to postpone our session to the second week or whatever was because he had to come back from the Philippines. Right. But, uh, so you need to communicate him about dates uh, because he'll always be there. So that's what I need to, to do. I, I was hoping that he would still be there because this would be more convenient. And I need to see when his obli family obligations there in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And um, and also if if you, your availability and going, if that's, um, if that's something that's a possibility for you. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll see about that. But Ben could do the course. 
Okay. Okay. At this point, it looks like October, what I proposed to our site, which is the Jimmy, I think, Yen Center, just outside of Manila. Mm -hmm. At this point, the so dates would, I proposed October 15th to November 1st. So um, that would be full, uh, full 15 days there in Manila, which is, which is about the extent that our students now can get off work and, and participate. We used to have the month-long sessions, and that, that has been difficult for our students to, to uh, negotiate with work and, and other responsibilities. So then the question for you, Sani, I, I don't know if you want to think about it right now, is just your availability to go there for part of that time, and I need to talk with Alice and two about um, USIP. And there may, might be a way for you to, to kind of do a, a cooperative type of session there since you've, you've worked with them. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, since there would be some overlap with the peace building. I, I, some, I mean, yeah, we have to post, I have to post the information and discuss with Alison as well. Okay. But it's in the realm of possibilities, so. Okay, so you are not traveling. It'd be a question if you if you had already, you know, if you have plans to travel during that time. So no, no I don't have plans. So okay. we are the first plan for the moment. Oh, oh, good. Okay, please keep us the first plan. <laughs> so yeah. I will then probably I'll direct an email to to both you and Allison and please. and see what we can work out with that. Please. So and then Henry again, I'll direct an email to, including James and 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 Ben and and you and. Uh, and and Andrea will will talk more also. So, thank right. you so much, all you guys, for coming on. This is a big commitment, and we really appreciate it. And and it sounds like a lot at first. I I hope it's just presenting kind of all of the opportunities and in, in one big dump. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's to show you what's out there now, and then but you're not expected in the course to use all of those features of Moodle. It's showing you what the possibilities are. Well, that's right. Thank you, Christy. Uh, you pretty much just encapsulated what I was going to say. Uh, and remember that this session was recorded. Um, I'm going to post it to YouTube and then send a link out to everyone. So you may find it useful to go back over certain elements of the workshop. Thank you. So with that, uh, we're coming up on 11 here. Uh, thanks again for your participation. And I know all of the old timers here uh, are really looking forward to working with those of you who are new timers. So um, hope to see you very soon. Thank you. See you, all. you. See you all later. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>